Hello, my name is Hassan Mir, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this uh, first episode of a four-part series uh, titled Informed Treatment Decisions for Pain Management, Changing Habits, Improving Outcomes. So this will be the first episode, and today it's titled, Can an Over-the-Counter Drug Really Take Care of Musculoskeletal Pain? So again, my name is Hassan Mir, and I'm a professor and director of the orthopedic residency program at the University of South Florida, and the director of orthopedic trauma research at Florida Orthopedic Institute in uh, Tampa. And I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Kevin Gebke, who is the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis. So Kevin, uh, welcome and thank you for joining. It's great to be here, thanks. So our first talk, uh, of this uh, four-part series uh, is going to focus on a learning objective of uh, applying evidence and guideline recommendations supporting non-opioid management of musculoskeletal pain. So I focus my practice completely on musculoskeletal injuries, and Kevin, I'm sure as a, uh, as a uh, family physician, you see quite a few musculoskeletal injuries in your practice setting as well. Uh, just to give us an idea of the scope of the problem, I'd like you to kind of review some of the numbers that are out there. Right, absolutely. We, uh, we realize that in, in primary care, about 15% of the chief complaints that come into our offices are musculoskeletal problems. Many of them are acute, some are, are more chronic, but um, when you look at the, at the data, um, in, in the years 2010, 2011, um, there were 65.8 million musculoskeletal injuries reported. Um, and you know, it, it really ends up being 75% of the injuries accounting for nearly 2 million hospitalizations and 23 million emergency and outpatient visits. Ultimately, it ends up being one of the very common um, reasons people come into our office and, and we have to be um, very, very adept at, at treating those. In uh, managing these problems, um, you know, how much in the way of of uh, education and training uh, do most programs include with musculoskeletal medicine? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. We, there's, there was actually a survey um, done uh, around the year 2000 of um, graduating residents from family medicine and internal medicine um, asking that exact question, how competent do you feel with your musculoskeletal exam and with treating these types of problems? And about 20% of family medicine um, graduating residents reported feeling competent and about 3% of internal medicine residents as they were entering into um, the primary care workforce. So, so I think that gives you a pretty good idea that we've missed the mark in our training programs. And you know that, that type of information, especially um, at Indiana University, we've tried to focus a lot more on educating around the musculoskeletal exam, recognizing those um, patterns of injuries and obviously the treatment plans that go along with it. Well, that's, uh, those are really um, uh, sobering numbers to hear, uh, given the uh, huge number of musculoskeletal injuries that occur, as you highlighted, and how many of those are not being seen by orthopedists, but being seen by uh, primary care practitioners. So with regard to um, pain management then of these injuries, um, you know, it's been well documented uh, that we are in an opioid crisis in the United States. And if you look at the groups of physicians that tend to prescribe the most opioids, um, that, uh, that uh, almost a third of opioids are prescribed by family phys physicians, another quarter by internal medicine specialists, and then orthopedic surgeons are prescribing about uh, 10, 10 to 11 percent. And we only make up 2 percent of all physicians. But as you mentioned, a lot of the conditions that are being prescribed for by family medicine and internal medicine are musculoskeletal. So hopefully these discussions will go a long way to uh, to help give alternative uh, treatment modalities to, uh, to folks in different specialties. 
certainly. And I, I think we're seeing an evolution. We're right in the midst of it where um, people are working hard to um, at least wean people down on opioid medications. And, you know, it's still the fallout from um, a different era in medicine when, when we were trained to, to treat pain and treat it as a vital sign and treat it aggressively with opioids. So um, I, I'm not surprised by, by those numbers, especially what we're seeing in primary care. The good news is legislation, um, community action, um, patient education, all of those things are all pulling in our direction right now. One of the questions I, I often get um, is if, you know, especially for those patients that, that end up getting operated on, don't we really need to use opioids for all of these patients? And haven't had uh, the experience of, of working internationally and then, you know, as practice has evolved here in the U.S., I think there's pretty good data to support that uh, other medications, including acetaminophen, including NSAIDs, have really uh, good um, results, both uh, on their own and in combination, especially when compared to opioids for pain relief. Yeah, it's, it's telling. And I think it goes along with what we've learned over the last um, decade, and that is um, opioid use and abuse is really an American thing. We don't see it in other parts of the world. And um, I, I think people came to expect that opioids were going to be part of that um, treatment program. And in fact, now that we have better evidence to suggest that opioids aren't a necessary component, especially high doses for long periods of time, um, the, we have a, a very nice slide here that um, demonstrates um, the number of people needed to treat um, to see a 50% improvement in pain and that combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen that most people already have in their medicine cabinet um, was actually more effective in getting to that goal at a lower number of people to treat. So I, I am really... Um, excited about being able to use that kind of information in my practice and the training of residents and medical students. In response to, um, you know, uh, speaking to groups of physicians from around the country and, and also trying to um, write and research more on this topic for orthopedic surgeons, um, we noted that uh, there have been a lot of various uh, governmental agencies, state agencies, et cetera, who have put out um, guidelines, but not a lot of them specifically addressed musculoskeletal pain, uh, and none of them addressed acute musculoskeletal injury. A lot of them were, were for more chronic type conditions, arthritic conditions, or chronic back pain, but we felt that there was a hole in the literature for acute pain, so we went to um, uh, our uh, colleagues at the Orthopedic Trauma Association and, and tried to put together a comprehensive set of guidelines to help uh, folks not only in our own specialty, but in all specialties who are dealing with acute musculoskeletal injuries. So Kevin, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look over our guidelines, but uh, would these be something that would be helpful to you and your practice and, and other folks in, in uh, primary care settings? Absolutely. We, we've been referencing the guidelines that you were so instrumental in, in putting together. And we, we look to um, these examples as, as really um, the crux of, of how we're changing our practice, how we're changing our approach um, to pain management across the board. Out of curiosity, how was this received in the orthopedic surgery circles? So it depends on uh, the group you talk to. For the most part, people um, in orthopedics don't like being dictated to as far as how they practice medicine. So these were not mandates at all, but, right. um, but the best practices really gave uh, people ideas of things they could do beyond just medications, right? These are best practices that tackle not only uh, medication strategies, but also things you can do Co cognitively, physical strategies, systemic issues that you can do. So there were a lot that we included that a lot of uh, folk, a lot of colleagues um, were excited to see that we included. Um, the other uh, part of this was then um, that a lot of prior guidelines just kind of gave vague 
um, vague uh, guidance on what you should do with patients after surgery or after a major injury. So we thought that we would put real numbers and real prescriptions on ours to show real examples of what we're doing in our own centers uh, that would help uh, the folks out there practicing. Now, obviously, the caveat for all of these is that you have your own state laws and your own local practice routines that you have to be aware of. But uh, by putting real prescriptions and real patterns on there for major injuries, minor injuries, and then non-operative uh, conditions, we felt that uh, the feedback has been really good so people can just plug and play with these numbers if they want. I think it's really enlightening and, and actually eye-opening when people look at this and realize that all fractures do not require a prescription for Percocet or some strong opioid um, pain medication. I think that is, is really the mentality that many people had, whether it be in primary care where we do see a lot of uncomplicated fractures and in the, the emergency department. So, so the guidelines, I think, are, are serving um, well outside of the Ortho Orthopedic Trauma Association and, and more across the board of all of us that are engaged in that acute care. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that, that they're helpful. And, and in fact, that's, you know, the first uh, few tables, you know, in particular, the, uh, the one from um, after a major musculoskeletal injury procedure and after a minor musculoskeletal injury procedure are for patients who we took to surgery. So in general, you know, we're writing those scripts ourselves as the orthopedic surgeon on discharge. But I think we wanted uh, our colleagues in primary care to know that this is kind of what we're doing. And that way they can see that if patients are then coming to their office asking for additional medication that they know kind of where we're coming from. And then on the flip side, the third table that kind of we have included there is for non-operative conditions, which uh, emergency physicians, primary care practices may be seeing right off the bat. And we wanted to give guidance to folks who will be the frontline providers for these patients on what to do for a major bone fracture or a small bone fracture or a sprain or a strain. Yeah, it's a, I, I think it, gives us some credence to, to what we've been trying to instill upon our providers. At, at IU, I, I serve a couple of different roles. One of them is the oversight of all 250 of our primary care providers taking care of over a quarter of a million patients. And at the end of the day, when you can start to change um, the approach to, to care and really have this kind of an impact, um, especially in a state that, like many, has been ravaged by um, opioid abuse and, and addiction, it, it, it makes a meaningful difference. So um, thank you for, for this contribution. Right. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing that, that I don't want to get lost in the discussion, though, is, um, you know, we're talking about over-the-counter medications and relieving pain, but the, the medicines aren't the only part of the story. Uh, there also are the cognitive aspects and the uh, the physical aspects, the the simple things like ice and elevation that sometimes people will forget to recommend that uh, that go a long way. Yeah, and a big part of that is being able to utilize your team, um, recognizing that there's there's a limited amount of time that that we as um, physicians can um, spend with with our patients and having our team. Um, able to assist with splinting and, and all of the um, patient education around anti-inflammatory medication use in a, in a safe manner, using ice for that, that first um, early interval, activity modification, all of those things, um, I think is a, another piece of this that we don't often think about. You know, it, it's one thing to think about multimodal approaches. It's another thing to, to best utilize our team. And I, I think we're better understanding that with time as well. Yeah, certainly. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll uh, wrap up our, our first um, uh, episode. And uh, again, reviewing uh, our SMART goals of uh, being specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. 
And uh, thank you, Kevin, for, for joining me. And uh, we hope that the listeners uh, gained uh, significant knowledge from this first episode. And we hope that you'll join us for the uh, second, third, and fourth episodes. Thank you. Thank you.